In this video, Jordan Peterson will give you tips on how to be calm and composed in any argument or tense situation. For more videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel. How are you always so consistently composed and confident? <laughs> Well, I have an advantage, I suppose, in that I'm a clinical psychologist and I've spent 20,000 hours, although I'm not practicing anymore, I've spent 20,000 hours listening to people and maintaining my composure, sometimes under very stressful circumstances. Um, and so I've had a lot of practice doing that. Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm not that young. I'm just about 60 years old. And so I have a lot of experience behind me and I've seen a lot of things and I've learned to be detached to some degree. You know, that's one thing you learn as a clinician is people are always talking to you about terrible things and the difficulties in their life. And you can take that home and, and have it destroy you because you're constantly exposed to the troubles of existence and, and they're real troubles, you know? And I mean, it's not unique to clinicians. You see that with physicians and palliative care workers and people who work in morgues and emergency uh, responders. And like, there's lots of people who face the, the very difficult aspects of life very frequently. You detach yourself from it to some degree, you know? And I, I don't mean in a disinterested way. I mean, in a, in a way that is sort of allied with a longer term view. You know, like if I'm doing an interview now with, with, someone who's attacking me. I, and I actually haven't said that so far. You're saying program. it makes them miserable. And I, I can get irritable. I think I was too irritable in the GQ interview, for example, which some of you might have watched. So if you're going to play neurochemistry, let's go and do it. I think, well, I'm not going to jump to conclusions about how this is going to go, even, even with regards to how it feels right in the moment. We'll see how it unfolds across time. And I'll try to manage myself in the moment with the least amount of upset that I can manage. And it's part of the doctrine of minimal, minimal necessary force. Um, and then I did do some TV work um, at a local station here for a couple of years. And I had a good producer and he helped me realize that anger plays very badly in a public forum, like video and particularly. Now, I didn't have a tendency then, I suppose, to fly off the handle either, but it's not useful to, to lose your temper. It's not useful. I mean, I'm boiling inside. I'm a very emotional person, way too much. So it's not like it's not stressful. It's unbelievably stressful, but I can detach myself from that to some degree. And I'm really curious, I suppose that's another part of it. I like to watch. And when people really go after me, this is where the clinical practice is handy. I can snap into a different mode, which is, okay, I don't know what you're up to. So I'm just gonna watch you. And then I'm gonna figure out what you're up to because I can usually figure out what people are up to if I want to. I, I don't do that all the time because I actually don't wanna know sometimes what they're up to. I mean, look, people, lots of people have treated me extraordinarily well, don't get me wrong. I'm, but, um, and normally, you know, when, when you talk to someone, you accept their persona. You don't look behind, but if people mistreat me in some way or, or become adversarial, then I'm able to look behind the scene and think and see what they're up to, if I can remember to do that. I, one of the things I've learned, if you're, if you have a dispute with someone and it needs to be settled and maybe they need to change more than you, and that's not always the case because sometimes the settling requires change on your part, but let's say that they have to be defeated in some sense in comparison to you. You don't want to defeat them any more than necessary. You know, it's like you don't knock your opponent to the ground and then jump up and down on them three or four times in, in triumph. You know, you, you, you pin them and, let, and then let them up. Minimal necessary force, because any more than that just produces a counter reaction. And so, and I guess the other thing is too, is my motivation when I'm engaged, let's say in these discussions is that I'm not trying to win the argument. I'm not trying to win. 
I'm trying to say what I think as clearly as I can. And there is, there might be an element, there might be, one of the consequences of that might be what appears to be a victory, but the right victory is the victory for your ability to articulate what you believe. And that's what I'm trying to do. And so that's another reason to stay composed is like, well, okay, this person has just thrown a curveball at me. It's like, all right, so, well, I could be thinking, well, I don't want to be undermined by that. And I don't want to make a fool of myself. And I don't want to be put on the spot. And of course, all of those things are true. But mostly what I'm thinking about is, okay, well, now I've got that question. I want to answer as truthfully as I possibly can. What do I think about what was just said? And I'm not calculating the outcome. I'm assuming this is a mark of faith, right? This is the faith that, that, that people have talked about being something that has to be manifested necessarily. We've been talking about this since the dawn of time. What's the faith? The faith is that if you say what you believe to be true, then whatever happens is the best thing that could have happened. And I believe that. So that's what I, and I really believe it. Partly because I believe that if you're deceitful, which is the opposite of that, or manipulative or malicious or malevolent, but maybe primarily manipulative, then what you're acting out is your belief that deceit will bring victory. And I just don't believe that at all. I, I, I just, I think it's a preposterous claim. And so if deceit won't bring victory, then truth is what brings victory if there is such a thing as truth. And there's certainly such a thing as deceit. So there must be such a thing as truth. And so, and some of it's just curiosity too. It's like, well, I'm going to say what I think and see what happens. And that's an adventure. You know, that's the adventure of your life, really. And you don't want to miss that because that's what you've got in your life is for it to be an adventure. It's not an easy road. You know, it's a stormy sea. And what you have is the adventure of contending with God in the waves. That's what you have. And the way you do that is with truth. And then that sort of takes you out of the immediacy of the conflict, whoever it is that the conflict with whoever it is that you're talking to. You're trying to ally yourself with something that's deeper and more profound and more lasting. But I like, I don't think that I am particularly consistently composed and confident. You know, I think I have faith in the truth. It's not the same thing. And you know, I'm an emotional person. Obviously.